darling. Aye. How's it going? Hmm? Say, how long does it take to write a PhD thesis? It's a good question. Why do you ask? Simple. I just want to know how long it'll be before I can tell everybody that my husband is now a professor. Well, at the rate I'm going, you'll be old and gray by that time. What's the trouble? Well, I'm just not getting anywhere, that's all. The beginning's all right, but... May I hear it? Sure. Let's see. Here we are. First, imagine yourself looking at a sunset. Most of the time, we think of it as just a beautiful sight. But scientifically, it is a picture of something more. It's a picture of capacity for performing work. It can be peaceful one moment, and the next it can be as wild and unharnessed as a raging storm. Our very survival has depended on our ability to harness, convert, and make use of nature's energy. One of our early discoveries was to convert the energy latent in wood to provide heat to keep ourselves warm. found that the energy of falling water could be put to useful work. And we discovered that moving air could help us in our fight for life. We learned to use all these energies in planting and cultivation to provide us with food. But despite the fact that man was learning to master nature's energies, found himself a slave to back-breaking toil. Today, labor-saving machines on the farm have helped him master these energies. And in our factories, he uses thousands of tools to do his work. This progress hasn't been slow and steady, measured evenly over the centuries. On the contrary, within a scant hundred years, man has taken his greatest strides. For it was a little over 100 years ago that a scientist named Michael Faraday discovered that the energy needed to move a magnet through a coil of wire could be changed to electrical energy. Even more important, this energy could be transported by wires. In the space of one man's lifetime, a whole industry has been developed based on that simple principle, the electrical industry. That sounds good to me. Yes, but where do I go from here? The trouble is the electrical industry has become so complex that I'm not sure myself of how it all fits together. Can't these books help? That's the point. What I want to write about isn't in the books yet. Hey, I've got an idea. I ought to go see Ray. My Uncle Ray. Oh, the one in Pittsburgh? Yes, he's been in the electrical industry for years. Will you be gone long? I hope not. When are you leaving? I guess tomorrow. I'll miss you. Hello? Oh, hello, Peggy. Everything all right at home? Sure. But guess who just arrived? Who? Our favorite nephew, Hank. <laughs> Hank? What's he doing in town? Oh, he hasn't told me yet, but he wants to see you. When are you coming home? Oh, I can be there right away. All right. Goodbye, dear. You see, Peggy, I've been working on my PhD thesis in sociology, but I haven't been able to get anywhere with it. So I decided to come here. I'm sure Ray can help me. Sociology? What's that? Well, you see, Johnny, in sociology, you study groups of people and their functions in relation to all people. Huh? Oh, I'll explain it to you later, dear. But if you all will excuse me now, I'd better get dinner ready. Ray will be home any minute. Sure thing. Well, that certainly was a wonderful dinner. Yeah, Peggy's a good cook. Much too good for me. Say, what's the matter with you? You look like you've lost a little weight. You've been working too hard? Yes, I have. Huh? I've been working on my PhD thesis. You see, what I want to do 
It's a study of the relationship between the electrical industry and social progress. You mean what the people in the electrical industry are doing for society as a whole? Exactly. Oh. But I haven't been able to get anywhere with it. Hmm? Well, that's where you come in. You've been a Westinghouse engineer long enough to know something about it. Well, what's your trouble, my boy? Well, for one thing, the industry seems so diversified. The more I read about Westinghouse, for instance, the more I think that your company is in every kind of business. Well, in a way it is. But actually, each product we make is related to the other. You might say that energy is our business. Say, I have a drawing here that'll give you the whole picture of our work in a nutshell. One of our artists made it for our educational center. Now, you're going to be here a little while, and this will be a good reference guide for you. Now, once you understand this, you'll begin to understand the work of the entire industry. Look here a minute. Now, here you have it. The natural forms of energy. Falling water, oil, coal, their conversion to electrical energy in the power station and transportation by these wires to factories, homes, and farms where we need it. And much of our electrical energy is produced by releasing the energy in coal and oil by burning. And our company's work starts right at the beginning in the oil fields and in the coal mines. In a coal mine, for example, Electrically driven continuous mining equipment lightens man's burden of labor and increases his productivity many times. After the coal is mined, it's burned to get high pressure steam at the power station. Then we convert the heat energy of the steam into the mechanical energy of a spinning turbine. How much do you remember about turbines and generators from your high school days, Hank? Well, to tell you the truth, practically nothing. All I remember is that you put steam in one end and get electricity out of the other. Well, come on, I want to show you something. Here's a model I made for Johnny. Now, this turbine and generator light that bulb over there. Do you imagine this compressed air is our steam? It hits the blades of this fan, our turbine. When it starts turning, it makes our generator go. Now, the generator is nothing more than cause of wire rotating inside a magnetic field. And here, the electricity we generate is transported through these wires to light this bulb. Well, that looks simple enough. Simple? <laughs> yeah. Give this a try yourself. All right. That's a lot of work just to light that little bulb. Well, then, just imagine how much work is done in a modern power station. Huge installations like these house turbo generators that furnish power for over 75,000 homes. About three quarters of our electric energy is produced by turbo generators, some of them gigantic in size. Let's take a look at the inside of a turbine under construction. Our plants at Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have been making these since the turn of the century. The turbine weighs hundreds of tons and is built to run at such constant speeds that your electric clock keeps accurate time year in and year out. The rotor is constructed of hundreds of individual blades. A turbine blade looks simple enough, doesn't it? But the precision needed to manufacture it is typical of all the work that goes into the construction of this equipment. While this turbine is being constructed, hundreds of miles away, the generator part of the unit is being manufactured. Yet the turbine and the generator fit together perfectly. Precision is attained by careful design and by using specialized swing. In some designs, such as for the stator of a hydro generator, the work is so big that it has to be made in three sections so that it can be transported to its destination. Yes, the equipment that converts heat energy to electrical energy must be accurate, efficient, and strong enough to last for years and years. I can see why you're so wrapped up in your work. Well, you've only seen the beginning of it. Let's go back up to that drawing. 
Ray recalled for me the fundamental principle of changing heat energy to electrical energy. He explained the most significant fact about it is that it can be sent anywhere to perform useful work. In factories, in homes, and farms. To make sure that not much electrical energy is lost before it gets there, it is sent at high voltage. This is done by using transformers, lots of them. The first transformers in a transmission system are right at the generating station. They step up the voltage of the generators 10 times or more. This gives a push to the electrical energy strong enough to send it through hundreds of miles of wire. Transformers like these are built at Sharon, Pennsylvania. Incidentally, the larger the transformer, the less it costs to transmit energy. That's why Westinghouse has broken world's record several times in the past few years, building larger and larger transformers. The next day, I was taken through the East Pittsburgh plant, where I saw them making equipment that controls and protects the flow of electric energy as it is sent from place to place. Equipment like lightning arresters that guard against the tremendous surges of lightning storms. Large oil circuit breakers, taller than a house. Small oil circuit breakers that interrupt the flow of electric energy in case of short circuits. And compressed air circuit breakers, too. Then I saw disconnecting switches that determine the path of the energy through complicated transmission systems and other kinds of equipment that makes it possible to have uninterrupted electric service wherever we need it. Then John Amory, the foreman, had me meet some of the workers. Bill, meet Hank Larkin. Glad to know you, Mr. Larkin. Thank you. How are you? Fine. He's interested in what we're doing. Oh? Maybe he wants to see if we really do any work around here. <laughs> Say, uh, what kind of an insulator is this? This is for a high-voltage transformer. They're pretty important, eh? They sure are. I'd like to see any power system work without insulators. And they've got to be made so you can depend on them. If they weren't, I guess we'd be burning kerosene lamps in no time. <laughs> That's right. Come on, I'd like to show you some of the other insulators we make. OK. Nice meeting you, Bill. Well, Professor, how are you making out? Oh, fine. I've met a lot of people directly connected with this energy business, and I'm beginning to understand their point of view. They're aware of the importance of the work they're doing, and they're pretty proud of it. The foreman, Amory, told me that he's been working there over 30 years. Well, this may be part of the reason. They see the results of their work right in their own plants, where the electrically driven machines make their work easier and more productive. Now, to come back to this drawing over here, you can see how that kind of help comes through the transformers and distribution systems to all industry, so that in almost every factory in the country, electrical energy runs the drill presses, grinders, milling machines, punch presses, and boring machines. Electricity is used in the heating and processing of metals. Incidentally, our company engineers develop synchronized drives for machines like rolling mills. The operation is almost completely automatic. In the oil industry, electric energy is put to work pumping and drilling and piping and cracking. In the lumber industry, this sparker, fast, smooth, powerful, is operated by one man thanks to modern sequence control.
in paper mills, automatic drives, powered electrically, make a million tons of paper annually. In the transportation industry, electricity powers public conveyances safely and dependably. shipping industry, electric motors run all kinds of cranes and winches and drive giant ships. Huge motor-driven ventilating fans like these, bring fresh air to our underground tunnel systems so that thousands of cars a day can drive safely under our rivers. In the aircraft industry, electrical systems form the heart of the control equipment for our modern transport planes. for moving stairs in department stores carry people to and from their shopping in comfort and luxury. In Radio City, Westinghouse elevators travel 3,000 miles every day to carry 250,000 passengers. Our company serves not only industry, but the home as well. In our divisions that serve industry, Sales and engineering departments coordinate the planning of electrical systems for industrial plants, office buildings, and hospitals. For the application of industrial equipment to specific jobs is just as important as its manufacture. And as part of the company branch that manufactures products for their home, our distributors and our television and appliance retailers are located in every major city in the United States as well as abroad. For without effective advertising, distribution, and selling, energy conversion equipment would never have come to its widespread use. Here, boys, try some of these. They're fresh from the oven. <laughs> Don't tempt me. He's the one who's lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow, Hank? I've got something in mind for him. I want to send him over to see Mr. Johnson. Johnson? Who's he? I thought you might round out your picture by talking to one of our managers. Mr. Larkin? Yes, sir. Sit down, would you please? Thank you. It's very nice of you to give me your time. Not at all. I'm very glad to see you. Ray told me about this uh, thesis of yours. Now, I would like to get your general impression of all that you've seen. Among other things, I discovered how every member of the company is linked with the job of converting energy and take a real interest in their work, too. That's right. And did you know that tens of thousands of our employees feel that their work is important enough for them to own shares in the company? That's so. Now, is there anything particular that I could uh, clear up for you? Well, I guess you can. You see, it's been like putting the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together, and now I find I have a few pieces left over. <laughs> for instance, how does the manufacture of jet engines fit in with your work? That's a good question. Now, let me get back to some fundamentals. The jet engine was made to meet a need. In fact, the company's work was founded on meeting the needs of the public and the nation as a whole. Now, in order to find if we're qualified to meet these needs, we're constantly guided by scientific research. Now, in the case of the jet engine, it's a cute little model, isn't it? Yes, it is. You must remember that from our research on high-speed steam turbines, it was a logical step to the jet problem. You see, turbojets present a similar problem in the conversion of energy. But they changed the heat energy of burning fuel into not electrical energy this time, but into mechanical energy, strong enough to propel airplanes at tremendous speeds. And so, after a great deal of experimentation, we made the first all-American designed and built jet engine. Have a cigarette? Oh, thank you. See, I thought of something else that might arouse your curiosity. It's a plastic that we call micarta. Micarta. It resists moisture and wear and corrosion. It was found by our research laboratory when they were looking for a better electrical insulator. 
Now McCarter's used for many things. Uh, like, for instance, control cable pulleys used in airplanes. Uh, like those over on the table there. Let me show you. You see, uh, these are the pulleys here. Very important in the control of a plane. And this is McCarter, too. It's used for burn-proof tabletops. Now, for instance, uh, you can do this with your cigarette. Go ahead. Do what do you think. You see? And it's used for coffee tables and uh, even on that shelf over in the corner there. Oh, it's, is that an atomic power plant? Oh, yes. Our studies in this field go back as far as 1937. For a long time, we looked for a fuel to help us generate electric power uh, far from the usual sources of coal, oil, and water. Well, the atomic pile, which is nothing more than a furnace heated by the continuous splitting of atomic particles, seems to be the answer for the present. It just replaces burning coal. And it makes the steam, which runs the turbine and the generator in the power station. So you see, jet engines, micarta, atomic energy, like all our other work, are still in the field of energy conversion. Now, can you think of anything else where I could help you? I don't think so. You've been of great assistance. Well, be sure to call on me now if I can be of any further aid, will you? Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Say, there's one thing more. This might give you an idea for your thesis. What you have seen, how the organization works, is typical of thousands of other companies all over America. And it's living proof of what free people can do working together in a free society. I think my visit with Mr. Johnson helped round out my understanding of the industry. Come on. This will make you feel better. Oh, thanks, honey. Mmm. Black coffee, good. Almost finished? Yeah, I'm just checking my last chapter. I'm talking here about how the electrical industry has helped us overcome the everyday drudgery in homes and factories. Sounds interesting. May I hear it? Sure. You'll have to visualize the details. But I point out here how, in a period of 30 years, the use of power tools has increased the number of leisure hours per worker by 27 hours per week. And in the home, not so long ago either, mother had to bend over an old wooden wash tub for hours to do the family laundry. While today's housewife has modern automatic laundry equipment that saves hours of labor, and all she has to do is turn a dial. Her house cleaning is done easily and thoroughly in a matter of minutes. A great improvement over the hours of back-straining toil of grandma's time. And how many times was food spoiled in the old-fashioned icebox because it couldn't stay fresh and free of bacteria? In grandma's time, food waste presented a serious problem for the family budget. Today, food keeps fresh and tasty for days. And how many winters has grandpa carried in a heavy load of coal for the stove? But today, you can merely set the controls on your electric... Leave the house, and when you come back, your dinner is ready. Getting rid of food waste was always a problem until we learned to use electrical energy to do the work for us. This same energy now runs water heaters, dishwashers, and writing by candlelight used to be a tedious and eye-straining effort. But today, incandescent and fluorescent lighting systems for every occasion. Then there's the whole field of scientific and medical improvements. Think of the slow, tedious, blind probing and guesswork of yesteryear and the diagnosis of many complex diseases. That is gone. Today we have high-speed portable x-ray equipment developed specifically for mass chest examinations. With Floricon x-ray equipment, doctors are able to see moving organs in the patient's body clearly and distinctly. With it, the dim light of the fluoroscope is increased more than 100 times so that the vital workings of the human body, like the heart, are disclosed in brighter and more revealing detail. Other bodily functions can also be studied more thoroughly. Ultraviolet and infrared lamps now give us the benefit of the hidden energies in sunlight. 
when sunlight itself cannot meet our needs. Energy has been converted for our pleasure as well. It brings the magic of sight and sound into our living room and recreates masterpieces of drama and music. Funny how we take a lot of those things for granted. And that brings me to my final thought, which should be something like this. In the material progress made possible by man's conversion of energy lies a great hope for social progress. For it is upon our struggle for freedom from the drudgery of bare survival, upon our ability to create more time for education, upon our capacity to create comfort and dispel the primitive fears that lie deep within us yet, upon all these, our hopes for the future depend. Man's road to social progress lies in such hopes. A better future for himself, his children, and his children's children. Here is an industry working to fulfill those hopes.